Uh, it's been almost a year since uh, Mubarak was ousted uh, from power. Egypt, however, is still uh, unstable. There is a lot of uncertainty about uh, the future. To understand that, actually, we have to go back to what happened uh, in the 18 days that uh, ended by Mubarak's ouster from power uh, on February uh, 11th of 2011. There are actually different interpretations of what happened, and there are at least three groups who claim that they have the credit for ousting uh, Mubarak. The first group is the young activist who sparked the uh, uprising uh, on the 25th of uh, January. They claim that they should have the credit for ousting Mubarak because it was them who started the whole uh, process. And then uh, you have the Islamists, mainly the Muslim Brotherhood. They also uh, claim that they should have the credit for ousting Mubarak because it was them who mobilized hundreds of thousands of their members, not just in Al Tahrir Square, but all over Egypt. So they kept the pressure on Mubarak and his regime until he decided to leave. The third group is the military and the uh, Supreme Council of the Armed Services, known as CAF. They also uh, want to have the credit for ousting Mubarak. Uh, they believe, even they don't say that explicitly, it was them who showed him the door. You know, they told Mubarak that you don't have uh, our support, so Mubarak felt that he has to go. So there are these three competing forces who uh, uh, would like to have the credit for ousting Mubarak and who have different views about the future uh, of Egypt. That's why there is still conflict between these three uh, groups. But despite the uncertainty about uh, Egypt's future, one can argue that there are two facts about Egypt today. The first fact is Mubarak regimes has ended. And this is good news for Egyptians. I know there are some people who argue that Mubarak has left the scene, but his institutions or the institutions he created are still intact or Mubarak has left, but Mubarakism, or the way Mubarak used to handle things, are still in place. I don't agree with that. I think uh, the, the whole regime uh, came to an end, and I would even argue that it's not just Mubarak's regime that ended, but the political system that was created after the revolution of 1952 has come to an end. Egyptians feel empowered, they feel free, they look forward to uh, building, you know, a second republic, a second republic, uh, a republic based on a uh, balance of, of powers, based on uh, free and fair uh, elections. So what happened uh, is an end, not just to Mubarak's regime, but to the whole 1952 uh, regime. This is a fact that we have to deal with in Egypt today. The second fact is uh, the Islamist and mainly the Muslim Brotherhood is the key political player in Egypt today. The one uh, 50%, the Muslim Brotherhood alone won 50% of the seats of parliament. The Salafis, which is a, a more conservative a group of Islamists won about 25% of the seats. So Islamists combined have 75% of the seats of parliament. This will continue uh, to be a fact of Egyptian politics for many years to come. This is not just uh, one event or one elections, but Islamists will continue to be the key players in Egyptian politics for many years to come. So if you want to do business in Egypt, your address is the Islamist. Your address is actually Qatamiya, where the headquarters of the Muslim Brotherhood organization is located. Everyone in Egypt understand that. The military understand that. Before they decide on any issue, 
they consult with the Islamists, with the Muslim Brotherhood, and they try to get their approval. Even foreign countries like the US, before the release of the Americans who worked for NGO and institutions in Egypt, McCain too came to Egypt and he met with people from the Brotherhood to you know, ease the, the release of, uh, of the Americans. IMF officials also who came to Egypt to uh, negotiate an agreement, uh, a loan agreement of $3.2 billion, they had also to go to the Muslim Brotherhood and you know, negotiate with them on the terms of this uh, loan agreement. So the Islamists are going to be there, whether we like it or not, they're going to be the key player in Egypt for many years uh, to come. Uh, they're going to be the main player for many uh, reasons. The first reason is they have the best and uh, uh, well-financed, uh, well-organized political machine in Egypt today. They are spread all over Egypt to the smallest you know, districts and villages, and whenever there is an election, they can mobilize uh, this machine. Nobody else can match this political machine. The only balance to this machine was the machine of the National uh, Democratic Party, the former ruling party, uh, uh, the party that is now uh, dissolved. So there is nobody to compete with them as a political uh, party. They also have a lot of resources. It's a very rich organization and it managed actually uh, to establish a lot of services in the poor areas of Egypt. So they replace the state as a provider of basic services like education, healthcare, and, and so on. The, 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 the new thing is now they're going to form the government. So they will be able also to use the resources of the government, the state budget, to create patronage. So if we put together all these factors, this is a recipe for staying in power for so many years. So this is actually the second fact about Egypt today. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamists are the key player, and they're going to be the key player for many years uh, to come. What about the other uh, players? We have the, the military council, the SCAF. Uh, most probably, they're going to leave or hand over their executive power by the end of June. They're going to hand over this power to the newly elected uh, president was supposed to be elected or the first round of election will take place on the 22nd and the 23rd of uh, next May. I have no doubt that the, the military council will hand over their executive power to the newly elected president. They already handed over their legislative power to the newly elected uh, parliament. But they want to secure an honorable exit from power. They don't want to be persecuted in any way after they leave uh, power. And they also want to uh, guarantee uh, or secure the interest, mainly the economic interest of uh, the military as an institution. Uh, the, the, the military in Egypt uh, is a huge economic uh, institution that have all kinds of factories and services and so on, and they want to maintain uh, the interest of this economic uh, institution. But I have no doubt that they will leave the, they will eventually leave uh, power. So the military is still there, probably until the end of uh, June. And then we have also uh, the so-called liberals. The, the, the liberals in Egypt, uh, as I was talking to uh, Dr. Uh, Nizar a uh, few minutes ago, I don't consider them you know, an alternative to the Islamists in Egypt. You know? Despite all the romance about their role in the revolution you know, and uh, things of that sort, they're very weak, they're fragmented, uh, they don't have real roots, they don't have grassroots in the society. You have a few individuals who claim to be 
liberals, but you don't have a real liberal party or a real liberal institutions. In the past election, uh, uh, two parties who uh, claim to be liberal, uh, each uh, won about won about seven uh, percent of the seats of, of parliament. The first one is called uh, the Egyptian Bloc or Al Kutla Al Masriya, which was founded by a businessman uh, Nagib uh, Sawiris. Uh, they won less, actually, a little bit less than seven uh, percent of the seats mainly because uh, the Coptic Church gave orders to its voters uh, to vote for this bloc. So it was more a sectarian uh, vote rather than, you know, a vote by, you know, uh, average uh, uh, Egyptians. And then you have the Wav uh, party who used to, you know, carry the tradition of liberalism uh, before 1952. The, the Wav party also won about 7% uh, of the seats of, of parliament. So if we look at the Muslim Brotherhood, they got 50%. The, the Salafis, who were represented by El Noor party, won about 25% of the seats of parliament. So the ultra-conservative, orthodox Muslims actually won more seats than uh, the so-called liberal in Egypt. And it shows you how weak, you know, uh, these liberal uh, forces are in uh, in Egypt uh, today. Uh, there is another important force, actually, <coughs> which is uh, going to be the, the new president of Egypt. You know, the, the new president will be elected, as I said, in, in May. Probably by the first week of June, we'll have a new president in in Egypt. The, the interesting thing about uh, the election, uh, the presidential election in Egypt, is that all the candidates do not belong to any political party. Okay? The, the major political parties, the Brotherhood, uh, the, the Noor, the Wavd, decided not to field any candidates. Okay? So you don't have any candidate who can rely on a party machine or you know a party to support him or her we basically have uh, six uh, candidates candidates three of them have some islamic tendencies and three of them are uh, you know non non islamist two of the non islamists uh, have strong links with the former regime of mubarak one of them is uh, amro musa uh, the former uh, foreign minister of Egypt and also the former secretary general of the Arab League. Uh, another one is Ahmed Shafi, who was the last uh, prime minister of Egypt under uh, Mubarak. And just yesterday, uh, a new uh, candidate uh, announced that he will run for president. Uh, his name is Mansour Hassan. He is um, a former minister of information, but under Sadat. You know, the three of them are probably 70, 72 years old, so they don't really reflect, you know, the new sentiments in in in, in and the new spirit in uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, the other three uh, pro uh, pro Islamic uh, candidates. Uh, <coughs> One is called Abdul Minam Abu Fituh, who was a former member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, another, the second is called Salim Al Awa, who is an Islamic intellectual, and the third is Hazim Abu Ismail, who has close links to the Salafi uh, movement. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, declared that it's not going to have uh, a candidate in in the election but they will probably endorse one of these uh, candidates. Uh, it seems that they might actually endorse uh, Mansour Hassan, who announced that he's going to be a candidate just yesterday, and the military council might also endorse him for, for presidency. But we, we have a new electoral map in, in Egypt. In the last uh, 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 presidential election under Mubarak, uh, 
something like 20% uh, participated in the vote. In the last parliamentary election, uh, uh, about 50% voted in this election. So it's double you know, the turnout level that used to be under uh, Mubarak. So we don't know uh, how those new voters are you know, going to vote, in which direction they're, they're going to vote in the presidential uh, election. Uh, the problem with the new president is, since he's not, he doesn't belong to any of the political party, uh, all those candidates are trying to cut a deal with the Islamist and uh, specifically the Muslim Brotherhood. So once any of those people is elected, uh, he will feel indebted to the Muslim Brotherhood and to the Islamists. So he'll probably be, be weak vis-a-vis -vis the Islamists, and that will add more power and more influence to the Islamists uh, in Egypt. Uh, <coughs> so those are the main political players in Egypt uh, today. Uh, the main issues that are being uh, debated in Egypt today are the following. The first is drafting a new constitution for, for Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian parliament is in the process of selecting a committee of about 100 uh, members to start writing a new constitution in, in Egypt. And there is a lot of talk in Egypt and outside of Egypt about uh, the nature of the state, the Egyptian state under this uh, constitution. Is it gonna be a secular state? Is it gonna be a religious state? And I don't think uh, this issue will be subject to a lot of debate within this committee. I think there is a consensus within this committee that uh, Egypt will be what they call a civil state or Dawla Madaniya in Arabic. A civil state is uh, a more appropriate term that Egyptians use instead of using uh, the word or the phrase secular state because secularism has some negative connotations in, in Egypt. So Egypt will be a, a, a civil state. Uh, I don't think uh, Article 2, the famous Article 2 of the previous constitution, the 1971 constitution, uh, which states that the, the Sharia or the principles or, or, or the Sharia, the principles of the Sharia will be the main source of legislation. I don't think this will change. It will stay uh, uh, the same. Uh, other articles also concerning uh, equality before the law, regardless of religion or gender or race, they will stay intact as, as well. So this civil nature of the state is not going to change under the new constitution, even though it's Islamists who are going to uh, mainly write the new constitution. The, the, the biggest debate, constitutional debate, will be on the type of political system for Egypt, whether it should be presidential, parliamentary, or semi-presidential uh, systems. Uh, system, sorry. Uh, the Islamists, actually, the Muslim Brotherhood, wants Egypt to turn into a parliamentary system, something like the Turkish model. So you could have not just the majority of parliament, uh, like what you what they have now, but you could also uh, be able to form uh, the government, okay, uh, and you know occupy both the legislative and the executive uh, branch. But they don't want actually to carry the whole responsibility in the short term. So most probably the new constitution will create uh, a system where uh, a president and prime minister will share the executive power. But it will take more powers from the president and give it to the prime uh, minister. So you will have under the new system, you will have a, a very strong uh, prime minister and a weaker president compared with uh, uh, you know uh, the powers that 
president in Egypt used to enjoy uh, before. Uh, so the, the president will be elected directly by the people, responsible before the people, and the prime minister will come from the majority party in parliament, that is, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and the Noor uh, party, and the prime minister will be responsible before uh, uh, parliament. Uh, so, so this will be the, the, the new political system that Egypt will have in, uh, at least in the, new, in the near uh, future. But eventually, as I said, the Islamists want to turn Egypt into a parliamentary uh, system. Uh, the other debatable issue uh, in writing the constitution will be on civil military relations. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the military is a huge economic uh, institution and they want to preserve their budget and they want to preserve their economic uh, interest. And they are now in negotiations with the Muslim Brotherhood to achieve these uh, goals. <coughs> so most probably the, the Brotherhood and the military will agree that there will not be real oversight uh, of the military in parliament, most probably all the military issues will be dealt with in a small uh, committee of armed services, not the whole uh, Egyptian uh, parliament. The other thing that uh, uh, the military and others are thinking about in Egypt is to create something uh, uh, called uh, uh, a national defense uh, council or Maglis Defa Watan, in which the military along with uh, civilian officials will be represented and uh, this group of people will handle national security issues. So national security issues will not handled by uh, civilians uh, alone or by civilian government, but the military will play a role in, uh, in that. Uh, other than that, I don't think there will be uh, much of uh, a debate in uh, the constitutional uh, committee uh, that will uh, write uh, the new constitution. Uh, the other issues actually that, uh, or the, the other important issue that concerns a lot of Egyptians today is the economic uh, challenge. You know, Egypt is in a, a very bad economic uh, situation. I'll just give you some numbers here. Uh, economic growth is down uh, from 5.1% in 2010 to 1.2% uh, this last year. Uh, un unemployment rose from 9% uh, to 12% uh, last year. And uh, the, the number is doubled, actually. It's between 24 to 30 percent among young people. There is a high level of unemployment among uh, young people in Egypt. Uh, foreign reserves are being uh, depleted by an average of two billion uh, dollars uh, a month. Uh, foreign debt has risen to uh, 34 uh, billion uh, dollars and domestic debt is the highest in Egyptian history. Tourism revenues declined by 80%. Uh, there was no foreign investment coming to Egypt uh, last year. And uh, there is a process of uh, renationalization of privatized assets has started uh, also in the past uh, uh, year. So the economic situation is actually uh, very bad in, in Egypt. Uh, any new government, new president will have to put the economy as a first uh, priority. Uh, government will have to restore confidence in the economy first and hopefully restore the level of growth and investment to that before uh, the revolution or the uprising uh, took place and then, you know, build on that uh, to achieve uh, prosperity for uh, Egyptians. Uh, as a result of the uprising, uh, Egyptians have a lot of expectations, you know. Everyone thinks that, you know, after Mubarak left, all his or her problems will be 
will be solved. So it will be a, a big challenge for any government to meet some of these uh, challenges. Egyptians also look at the Iraqi model and they don't want to be a second Iraq. You know, a country where you have democracy, you have election, but more or less you have a failed state. You know, a state that is unable to deliver uh, services to uh, its uh, citizens. So democracy is not going to be enough or elections are not going to be enough for Egyptians and uh, they look forward to, uh, you know, uh, meeting their uh, economic demands uh, as well. Uh, the other uh, important uh, issue that is uh, facing uh, Egyptian is that of uh, security, personal security. For the first time, you know, many Egyptians fear for the safety of themselves and for the safety of their uh, families. Uh, on the 28th of uh, January uh, of 2011, the Egyptian police collapsed, you know, under the pressure from the demonstrators. So it, it and, and they lost actually confidence in uh, themselves. So uh, any new government will have to uh, restore confidence in, uh, in the police and they will also have to, you know, uh, implement new programs of training for, uh, for the police force in order to adjust when the, with the new democratic uh, environment in, uh, in Egypt. There are also uh, some important political challenges that will face uh, the new government and the new uh, president. The first is actually how to create a functioning political system. As I said, uh, uh, the, the, new, the new constitution will create uh, a political system where a president and a prime minister will share the executive uh, power. This on paper could be a good system, you know, you share responsibility, but responsibilities, but in reality it could actually uh, lead to a deadlock, especially if the president comes from a certain party and the prime minister comes from uh, another party. Uh, in, in, in today's Egypt, you need actually decisive decisions, you know. So uh, this new system actually might not work. It might not be uh, functioning uh, to achieve uh, the desired uh, goal. Uh, Egypt also needs to build a more representative political system. Yes, Egypt had uh, a free election, but if you look at the parliament, it is not really representative of, you know, all the sectors of the society. Uh, the number of women who are represented in parliament is very, very small. The number of Copts <coughs> or non-Muslims who are represented in parliament is also very small. So there will be a need actually to at least, you know, change the electoral system in Egypt to have a more representative political system, which is not the case uh, today. There is also, there will also be a need to deal with the issue of religion and state. You know, uh, the, the constitution and the law uh, ban the establishment of any religious uh, or any political party based on religion. But this has been violated right and left. You know, we have the, the party of the Muslim Brotherhood, we have the Noor party uh, uh, representing the, the Salafi uh, movement, and we have also a very interesting phenomenon in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood created its own political party, uh, the, the Freedom and Justice uh, Party, but at the same time maintain its institution, the Muslim Brotherhood. So you have the party, which has its, you know, secretary general and members and so on. But at the same time, you still have the, the Muslim Brotherhood, which doesn't, 
is doesn't have uh, any legal foundation under you know the law or the constitution and it still functions as well as a parallel institution that has its al uh, murshid al am or the supreme guide of the the muslim brotherhood so it's like <coughs> a state within the state you know so uh, uh, any future political arrangement of egypt will have to deal with this issue okay if you want to practice politics then you have to separate politics from uh, religion and you have to play by the legal rules of uh, the system <coughs> another important issue that needs to be dealt with also is the issue of uh, civil liberties and uh, civil rights you know a lot of women a lot of uh, cops are concerned uh, about you know uh, their 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 views uh, about the role in uh, in the society and and so on and actually some um, institutions have started to impose self censorship on itself you know like if you if if you look at some uh, tv station uh, stations in egypt now they they play now more conservative content you know than than before nobody asked them to do that there is no law that forced them to do that but they think that egypt is becoming a more conservative place so they have to go along with that some restaurants have actually banned the selling of alcohol again there is no law that you know requires that but it's part of the new environment that exists uh, today in in asia and the last point here is that there is a need to create a balance in the egyptian political map as i said earlier the the islamists now constitute 75% of the seats of parliament they're going to be the key player in egyptian politics for uh, many years to come and there is a need to create you know a, a political movement a party to provide an alternative uh, to the islamist in the future this will be a big challenge to the non islamist uh, forces in in egypt um, the last points i would like to make here is on uh, foreign policy there are a lot also of challenges in the area of foreign policy of uh, of egypt the new factor is uh, the public opinion is going to be a key player in formulating uh, foreign policy in egypt and this is a new factor in uh, in egyptian uh, politics i don't think the the new president or a new prime minister in egypt will uh, abolish the peace treaty with with israel but they're going to use that as a bargaining chip to get more uh, assistance from uh, the us but one has to put in mind that the islamists uh, in egypt uh, will be more supportive of hamas you know in 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 palestine to what extent that will change uh, an egyptian policy vis-a-vis -vis israel uh, uh, remains to be uh, to be seen uh, islamists will also face difficulty in dealing uh, with issues related to cooperating with with israel you know the egyptian economy or egyptian exports uh, depends on cooperating with israel in something called qualified industrial zones uh, uh, the americans the egyptians and the israelis uh, agreed to create something called qualified industrial zones in egypt where egyptian products that has a small component of israeli products can come to american markets with no uh, restrictions or customs at all and a lot of egyptian actually are in favor of expanding you know these uh, qualified industrial zones because it generates a lot of revenue for for egypt so it will be very critical for uh, the the islamist to to deal with these uh, issues however as i said at the beginning within this division of labor between the president and the prime minister uh, the islamists probably 
will not uh, would not want to uh, carry the responsibility of foreign policy issues. They're, they're going to leave that to the president, at least for uh, the short, for the short uh, term. Uh, and therefore, I don't think there will be uh, a major uh, uh, change in Egypt's uh, foreign policy orientation, at least in uh, the short uh, term. Uh, just to conclude, and maybe you have more uh, uh, time for questions and comments, Egypt is changing. Egypt is going through a transition. It's going to be uh, a long and difficult transition, but I am sure that there is, a, there is no going back to the same kind of system, authoritarian, autocratic system that existed in Egypt uh, before, existed under Mubarak. Sadat and Nasser, how Egypt is going to be, is going to look like in the future. Uh, it's difficult to tell, uh, to tell now, but it's going to be the products of all, you know, the factors and the players uh, I talked uh, about. And I would like to thank you for uh, sharing these views with, uh, with me, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. I would say the jury is still out on that. <laughs> Nobody actually uh, knows. Um, however, uh, Egypt is a different place today, you know, and uh, public opinion is very strong. And the media also is very strong in, in Egypt, and it's independent media, you know, uh, owned by individuals. And fortunately, it's not controlled by the Islamists. Uh, so it's balancing, you know, them some, uh, somehow. Uh, and already the Islamists have been uh, criticized on several issues. And they had to change their attitude, not because there is a strong opposition in parliament, but because there is a strong media that is critical of them and there is a strong public opinion that is also uh, critical of them. So maybe eventually, you know, the media could educate the people, you know, about the necessity of having an alternative to, to the Islamists. This is probably the only hope that uh, I, could see, uh, I could see now. Uh, but again, I, I would argue that uh, the Islamists are going to be in power for many years to come. They will probably, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, they will moderate their positions because they want to succeed, you know. So now there is a, a, a major economic problem. You need investments from abroad. You need investments from, from the U.S. You need American assistance. You need a loan from, you know, the IMF. So you have to deal with these entities. You have, you know, uh, to change your your policies. You have to lower your rhetoric. Uh, having said that, uh, I would also argue that the Muslim Brotherhood is an ideological organization. There is no doubt about that, you know. But they will be. Uh, pragmatic in implementing their ideology, you know, like uh, now they don't want to carry the whole responsibility for running Egypt. Uh, this is their future goal. So for the time being, they want to bring, you know, uh, someone from outside the ranks to be a president for Egypt, you know, to share the responsibility uh, with them. So they, they will continue to be an ideological uh, organization that eventually wants to turn Egypt into, you know, uh, a state based on uh, the Sharia uh, law. Uh, some of them even actually talk about the return of the Islamic Khalifat, you know, an Islamic uh, sort of, of an empire. <clears throat> like the Ottoman, uh, like the Ottoman uh, Empire in 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 the past, 
Uh, but in, in the short term, at least, they will have to uh, deal with reality, you know, and they have to be practical. And that might uh, moderate their position. Another factor also is that even within uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, there is um, generational differences. You have the so-called old guard and you have the young guard. The young guard is uh, more open-minded. Uh, they're more in touch with what's going on outside of Egypt. They're devout Muslims, okay? Uh, but the, the might or be more willing to borrow, you know, uh, uh, modern uh, techniques and, and, and modern uh, methods. And eventually it's this young generation of Muslim brothers who will lead the institution in the future and they might make uh, a difference. Uh, they're no longer there actually. Uh, uh, they fill uh, the vacuum when the police collapsed, but it, it actually uh, showed Egyptian that they can rely on themselves, you know, to solve their problems. Uh, that might have some uh, uh, positive uh, results because, you know, uh, the state in Egypt is very dominant. You know, it controls everything. So the first time, you know, you have individuals who uh, carried the responsibility of, you know, uh, securing their, their homes and their streets. And so that, uh, for me, was a, a positive, uh, was a positive development. Many actual the young people who went on uh, demonstrations on the 25th of, of January uh, were university students who belong to uh, the middle class. You know, uh, it's people who uh, understand or speak foreign languages, who have access to uh, the internet, you know, social media, and 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 and, and so on. Uh, and uh, some of them were so. Some of them are, uh, you know, the product of the economic reform that took place under Mubarak. It's the Mubarak regime, actually, that, uh, you know, created jobs for, for them. Uh, but the Mubarak regime could not meet their uh, political demands, you know. Uh, so that's why they revolted against, uh, against uh, uh, the, the regime. Uh, <coughs> as I said, many of them are uh, frustrated. Uh, some of them actually uh, thinking about uh, leaving Egypt and, you know, going to find uh, jobs uh, either in the U.S., Canada, or the Gulf region. Uh, not just because they're frustrated politically, but because of the deteriorating, you know, economic condition that ex exists in Egypt uh, today. They're, they're really frustrated, okay? It's just two or three of them who managed to win seats in, in parliament. And they feel that, you know, with the results of uh, the elections, it's back to, uh, you know, the old business in, in Egypt. Uh, even the Muslim Brotherhood, they were part of the old regime and they used to cut deals with, even with state security in, uh, in Egypt. So they're really, they're really frustrated, uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, they're very divided. They, they failed to uh, unite their forces to establish, you know, uh, one political party or to have one leadership. Uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> so they don't really have any influence on the political system uh, today. Uh, the, 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 the Supreme uh, Military Council uh, tried to appoint some of them in, in Parliament. The Council had the right to appoint about 10 members of Parliament, 
but they refused to be appointed in, uh, in Parliament. Uh, they uh, start demonstrations every now uh, and then to show that they still uh, exist. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, they, they feel uh, frustrated. Uh, they feel that they're not represented in, uh, in, in government or in, uh, in the parliament. That's the, their situation uh, today. So they don't really play any, any political role except participating in small demonstrations every now and then. The current government in, in Egypt is not uh, a political government. It's a technocratic uh, government. But the Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood, wants to uh, form a new government because they, they think now they're the majority in parliament, so they are entitled uh, to form a new government. Uh, the problem actually with this uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, government uh, is that it might uh, turn uh, to be a, an experienced government, like the one in Tunisia. Because the Muslim Brotherhood used to be in opposition for so many years. So th they master the art of opposition. They probably don't know how to run a government, which is not uh, an easy thing uh, to do. Uh, what they're doing now actually is they are preparing, preparing some of their members uh, for ministerial positions. They have someone called Khairat al Shatir, who is the deputy supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood. He's a businessman, so they sent him to Turkey, you know, to learn from the Turkish uh, experience. I don't know if this will work in Egypt or not. You know, it's completely different, uh, different environment, but uh, they may fail. You know, uh, again uh, because you don't have experience. You know, they never been in any executive position. You know, not just ministerial position. They never, you know, they have never run anything in Egypt. Not even you know uh, a village or a district. So now they're going to be in charge of the whole country. Uh, I don't know if they will, uh, they will succeed or not. The other thing is, you know, uh, Egypt is facing, you know, huge economic problems. And we will be very lucky if after two years we go back, you know, or achieve the same uh, growth rates that we had before Mubarak, uh, Mubarak leaves, uh, Mubarak left. Uh, so it, it will be a big uh, challenge uh, challenge for them, uh, and that's why they realize that you know uh, they shouldn't carry the responsibility alone, and that's why they didn't field a candidate for president, and they said that they're not gonna vote for an Islamist candidate. You know, if a candidate say I'm an Islamist, I have an Islamist ideology, they're gonna tell their members not to vote for this person because you know they want another person to carry the responsibility with them uh, it's really a very sensitive issue and uh, uh, i think uh, uh, there will be a, a sentence declared in the mubarak case on june 2nd so that's the, the, the same week that Egypt will probably have a new president. How this will play out, uh, I don't think this is going to be the end of the story. You know, if Mubarak is uh, proven uh, innocent, uh, I think the district attorney will appeal. Uh, if he's proven guilty, Mubarak himself will appeal. So all these cases are going to live with us for probably uh, a year or two in the future. There will no, uh, there is, there isn't going to be an immediate settlement on uh, on on these issues.
the good news about the economic problems in Egypt is that uh, the economic infrastructure in Egypt is still intact. You know, there wasn't uh, a civil war or, you know, that destroyed the economy. Uh, part of the economic uh, problems uh, is due to political instability. Once you have uh, a new president, a functioning uh, political system, I have no doubt that tourism will come back, uh, foreign investments uh, will come back, and this might provide, you know, uh, opportunity for, uh, for, uh, for economic uh, progress in the future. But again, you know, Egypt today is a different place. It's not going to be enough to go back to the same levels of growth that existed under Mubarak. People are looking for more. There is a, a revolution of expectations in, in Egypt. Whether the newly elected president or government will be able to meet this expectation or not remains to be, uh, to be seen. But it, it is not going to be difficult at least to restore the same level of uh, foreign investment, economic growth, uh, number of tourists uh, in the near uh, future after a president is, is elected. Uh, Turkey is definitely a model for, uh, for, uh, for the brotherhood, especially uh, the economic aspects of uh, of the Turkish experience, you know, they're not very fond of the political aspects of the Turkish experience, especially you know secularism, because Turkey is a secular state, you know, you cannot establish a political party based on religion in in Turkey. If you say that you're going to implement the Sharia, your party is dissolved the following day, and you might be uh, banned from. Uh, practicing politics for for some years. So the Muslim Brotherhood is not really fond of this secularism about the Turkish experience. But they want, uh, uh, you know, a, a free market uh, supply and demand uh, economy. They want more investments uh, from abroad. The difference with Turkey is geography. You know, Turkey is part of Europe. Uh, wanted to be part of the European Union, so the European Union provides, you know, sticks and carrots, and uh, for the Turks, and that helped Turkey to evolve to what it is today, economically and politically. Uh, Egypt doesn't have this, you know. Uh, Egypt will probably depend on uh, the U.S. and more on uh, the Gulf uh, countries for for assistance, but. As I said, there are a lot of visits from members of the Muslim Brotherhood to to Turkey to interact, you know, to learn from their uh, experience. I actually don't want to comment on that because it's it's uh, you know before uh, the court uh, uh, now. Uh, I think it's a bit exaggerated. It's being used to uh, discredit everything that uh, uh, associated with uh, Mubarak and you know his uh, his associates. Uh, I don't have any evidence that there was corruption or there was no corruption. I think the problem with uh, the NDP was that uh, it didn't go all the way with regards to reforms. You know, it was, I, I like to call it, it's half reforms that led to half revolution. You know, uh, the, the NDP focused on uh, economic reform, but neglected uh, political reform, okay? Uh, it, it, it focused on growth, but it didn't address the issue or didn't address enough the issue of social uh, justice. Uh, corruption existed in Egypt before, will continue to exist uh, in the future, and uh, I leave it to uh, 
the law and the court system uh, to tell us exactly what happened you know, under the Mubarak regime. There is actually a wrong perception about the NDP. People think that you know, the NDP was running Egypt. This is not true at all. You know, people think that the NDP was like the Labour Party in the UK. You know, they have the majority in Parliament, so you're running the state. That wasn't the case at all. You know, uh, the NDP was um, an institution that was mainly active when there is uh, an election. You know, its role was to mobilize and get out the vote. That's the history of the NDP, and before that, you know, the Socialist Union and all the, the political parties that were associated with the government. What happened in 2002, that Gamal Mubarak became interested in, in politics for whatever reasons, and he uh, recruited and encouraged some people of his generation, uh, some people of similar background to uh, participate in policy through the, through the party. Okay, so I joined uh, many of my colleagues, uh, professors at Cary University, joined uh, to contribute to public policy. You know, it was a window for us to have some influence on public policy and to serve our country, you know, because we believe that the NDP is part of the state, you know. So uh, instead of working in the Ministry of Finance or Education or whatever, you're serving the country, your country through the party, which is associated, associated with the state. So what we were actually doing is uh, giving advice, writing you know, uh, policy papers, a uh, few of these uh, policies were implemented. Again, because we were not the Labour Party. You have, the, the NDP was a player, okay, definitely, the new NDP. But you had other players, you know, they had the president who has his own convictions and his own people working with him. You had the government, which uh, consisted of many people actually that did not belong to the NDP. You know, it was a government of technocrats, and they had also their their opinions and views and and stuff like that. So the NDP was, for me at least, was uh, a window, you know, uh, a new window to to the president, you know, uh, through his his son. Okay, but there were other windows, you know, it was, I hope we were in charge actually in, of, of policy, things would have <laughs> different, okay, uh, but we, we provided many uh, policy recommendations, economic, political and social, and they were never implemented. And at the same time, it was not, as they say, you know, clear, uh, clean and clear cut reform. Okay, you had the so-called young guards, which was one of them, but you had also the old guards in the in the picture, you know. So all the time you had to, you know, uh, see compromises uh, with them, which actually distorted the reforms. Okay, uh, so you had the old guards and the young guard in in uh, in the picture, but when the the crisis started, it was actually the old guard who ran the show, you know, and who were, you know, those are Mubarak's advice. Mubarak is not going to listen to me or to people from my generation. He listened to uh, people who are much older and who are his uh, generation, actually. So it's actually, uh, it's not fair to blame what happened on the NDP. The NDP was definitely uh, 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 a player, but it wasn't the, the only player, okay? There were other players, the government, the presidency, you know, state security, intelligence that governed Egypt. 
So I, I used to call the NDP actually a majority party in parliament, not the govern, not the ruling party. Because when it comes to ruling, when it comes to governing Egypt, it was not only the NDP that was governing. 